Death ends a life, not a relationship. Education can teach us to walk alone. What do these two sayings have in common? They've been guideposts for me over many years of my life. When I was 15, my mother died from cancer. She was 38. And her older brother had just died a couple years earlier at age 38. So I got to tell you, when I turned 38 and had two sons, it was really eerie. And it really hit me hard how much they had lost and how important it was for me to do something with the gift I had, which was still to be alive. And uh, I hadn't figured that out when I was 15, however. And so for the next couple of years, I, I was a really good student in high school, but I really wasn't thinking. I really wasn't connected to what I was studying. I just had a good memory and then it spit back what the teacher taught. So when I got to college, freshman year, sort of the same thing, sort of drifting through. And then I, I met this man, Bob Godino. Uh, this is a picture of him when he was on top of Katahdin. And Godino felt that students in those days were too sheltered. They were too sheltered and isolated from the diversity of the world around them. So he created a program, a, a novel, experimental, unconventional program called Williams at Home. And that's a program I did for a year, my sophomore year in college. And while there was courses and readings and films and things going on on campus, the core part of the program, the, the core transformational piece of it for me was the second half which is when I spent five months with four different families in four different parts of the US. My first homestay was in southern Georgia. I lived with a black family. I worked, ironically, given my mother's recent death, with a black funeral home in town. So I was driving the ambulance. I was driving the hearse. I was going to all the, the services. Uh, I went to a lot of black Baptist services. I saw speaking in tongues. I saw things I'd never even knew about or dreamed about before and I felt entirely welcomed by that community, except when I was interviewing a highly educated public official who, when he learned where I was living, and what I was doing, said that if I didn't stop, I would spend the rest of my days in the Okefenokee Swamp. Um, I thanked him. I left. I didn't leave my family, and I didn't stop working at the funeral home. But it was a wake-up call for me put me in the shoes of the people that I had just met and was living with. My next homestay was very rural, isolated, southeastern Kentucky, Appalachia, living with a coal miner and his wife. Very challenging, very depressing setting. Um, I then lived on a small family farm in Iowa, uh, learned how to castrate pigs, vaccinate baby pigs, not easy, uh, swap out the barns. And, and gave a lot of thought to why was I in college? I mean, there was so much going on in the world, so many problems. Shouldn't I do VISTA? Shouldn't I do something else? And then my last homestay was Detroit. And in Detroit, I worked in an auto factory in a stamping plant where for eight hours a day, I would pick up a piece of metal, put it in a machine, stamp the <coughs> buttons, large machine would come down, put this tiny little nut on the piece of metal. It would then blow into a bin and I would take the next one. And I had to do that 800 times an hour. And there was a little counter. And if I hadn't hit 800, the foreman came around every hour, what we call the white shirts. And if you didn't hit quota, he would make sure you knew it and you better hit it the next hour. So two things I learned from that experience. One was I, it came to life to me what Marx meant about alienation from labor. And the second was, you know, college didn't look so bad after all. <laughs> so I didn't do VISTA, I went back to Williams. But when I got back to college, I was far more motivated and far more dedicated. I had a context. I could connect what I was reading about, what we were talking about in class, to a world that I had actually experienced. And I was passionate about the value of what the program had been and how much I thought I had changed. In fact, um, I came back with long hair. I came back all fired up. I came back with my Iowa farm hat that I wore every day when I was on campus because I thought, wow, man, I'm really different now. And I can still remember speaking about that with Mr. Godina, which is what we called him, 
And he looked at me and said, Mr. Thaler, you haven't changed at all. I said, what do you mean? Look at me, you know, geez, I'm different. <laughs> and he said, you've just become more of who you already were. And I thought, no, that can't be right. But, you know, in hindsight, by the time I graduated, I thought, well, maybe he was partly right. I mean, I had become more self-confident. I become more self-aware. But I thought I was different, and I do believe it was different. And it was transformational for me because Godino was not just having programs where students had experiences. You had to use it. You had to reflect on it. You had to immerse yourself in it, but then get perspective on it. And, and he really pushed the model of uncomfortable learning. Not unsafe, not dangerous, but getting outside your comfort zone, getting into different places, different people from who you were used to, and challenging what you took for granted, your values, your assumptions, things you don't think about every day. So that stuck with me. Um, he proposed a second Williams at home. I fought for it, but unfortunately, all through the time I knew Godino, he was dying from a neurological disease that killed him right after I graduated. So I could not, I physically could not let go of what he had started. And I haven't been able to do that since. Um, flash forward many, many years later to the 21st century. I'm in Portland, I'm in Maine. And uh, as many of you know, Portland, refugee resettlement city, only of 70,000 people, but with over 55 languages spoken in our public schools. And I was mentoring a Sudanese boy at Portland High School and so struck and so moved by other Sudanese I met here who in the middle of January in Portland, um, I just thought they might as well have been on the moon compared to where they came from. And I was moved by their courage and what they were doing. And then I started thinking about Williams at Home and I thought, you know, I don't, students don't have to go abroad to have a different cultural experience. I could have them here. I could bring them at home and, and expose them to the refugee and immigrant community here. But I had no idea at all if it could even happen. Ultimately, I felt I could do it. I pitched it to Williams College and the response was, Jeff, come on. You're in the 21st century now. This is not 1970. Williams is far more diverse ethnically and racially. Students go abroad all the time. Is there really a need for this program anymore? And like a good lawyer and a good entrepreneur, I bluffed. And I said, absolutely there's a need for it without knowing whether there was or not. But having run the program for four years now and doing the fifth one this January, I'm here to tell you it's absolutely needed. And in fact, in a 21st century America that is far more ethnically and racially diverse, far more connected, interconnected, wired than when any of us in this room were born, we, and we spend eight hours a day, the average American, eight hours a day in front of TV, computer, PDA screens, there's a greater need to connect with people because we're more prone to indifference, bias, and stereotype than ever before. And so, and, and more students go abroad, school year abroad, but the majority of them, less than 2% of college students go abroad, the majority of them to Western Europe, and the majority of those live in dorms or comfortable host families. So, in brief, the program I created that I still do, uh, that's, as far as I can tell, unique nationally, uh, and I wish it wasn't unique, and I wish I wasn't the only one doing it, uh, is where students come here from Williams College, I find a host family, refugee or immigrant family for each of them. Each of them works for a service provider, mostly have been in the English learning language classrooms, English language learning classrooms in Portland, also uh, the City Health Clinic and Catholic Charities. They keep a journal, they have to write reflective essays, but ultimately the power of it is the homestay because the students are not there to study the family, they're not there to tutor, they're there to be part of the family. It is an equal level playing field. And one of the great things about it is that, um, and let me just show you a picture of uh, one of my groups of families and students from two programs ago, is that uh, in the own words of the students, it's been far more powerful and beneficial than I could have imagined, and it only runs for the month of January. That's the winter study program at Williams. Is, I'll give you three examples. One of the students 
who has been in uh, study abroad programs, lived with host families abroad, and then lived with a Somali family here, said it was far more powerful and more beneficial to her than those abroad programs because here she was living in a culture within a culture. And if you think about that, a culture within a culture, refugees are people who are forced out of their homes. They are forced to leave their home country. They have no choice versus immigrants who choose to come here. And so for many of them, they're trying to hold on to some of their home culture while trying to adapt and, and adjust to and understand the American culture. And so for the students, it was more tangible than being abroad in a foreign place. The, the second lesson was um, in this picture, three of those are, are of Ethiopian parents and one is an African-American girl from Brooklyn. And as you all in this room know, it gets very cold in Portland in January sometimes. And uh, one of my students didn't have a hat. She didn't bring a hat with her. So she borrowed a kerchief, put it on her head, and suddenly started realizing how many stares, how many negative reactions she was getting in Maine, in Portland, when she was going around with her host family. And even when she was African-American, black, looked like them, but without the kerchief, never noticed it. With the kerchief on, looking like a hijab, suddenly she realized how people were reacting to her Ethiopian family. And that was a very powerful experience for her. And the third thing is, this is not all about what do the students get out of it, it's about also what the families get out of it. And one of the, the girls in the family said, the students learn about us, but we actually learn more about them. And one of the best things for me is how much the families learn about what it means to be in college. Many of the families, have, students, including in the Portland schools that my kids work in, have never met a college student or I've never met a student going to a four-year college. They have no idea that it's even achievable. For them, it might as well be on the moon, but when they have a person in front of them, living with them, talking to them, explaining to them how you get there, it makes it much more achievable and tangible for them. So, ultimately, I, I've pushed the program because, and I've pushed the students because it's, it's part of the Godino legacy, but also because I'm convinced that it's needed as much or more today than ever before. I've told you why I've done the program. I've told you why it's needed. What I haven't told you is, why did I agree to do this talk? <laughs> because I have um, been driven by the fact that what I've learned over the years from my experiences and from Godino are a couple things. One, this was my group from last year, is that every person in a statistic, immigration statistics or otherwise, has a face, a family, and a story. And until you connect with that, you really can't understand what you're talking about or what the statistics mean. And secondly, uh, are a couple fundamental lessons. Silence is suspect. Adina used to say that. Dialogue, critical. You don't sit back. You've got to not only talk to people, ask them questions, but listen, actively listen. Indifference is unacceptable. We cannot, in our society today, in our state, tolerate indifference to what happens to our neighbors or others. Direct immersion in the unfamiliar is essential. Not studying it, not reading about it, not talking about it, but being in it. And then reflecting on it and talking about it. Ultimately, while in those days I had a lot of hair, I had a lot of hope, uh, had my Iowa farm hat. Um, flash forward 40 plus years, I don't have as much hair. Uh, I still have the hope, and I still have the Iowa farm hat. <laughs> uh, much to my wife's dismay that I haven't thrown it out. And it's a little more tattered than it was in those days, but hey, so am I. <laughs> and, the reason that I have it and the reason that I keep it is to remind me of the challenge, to remind me of the opportunity and the invitation that Godino gave me and that I've tried to give to my sons and I've tried to give to the Williams students and that today I'm giving to you. And that is to get out of your chairs, to push away from your screens, 
to get out of your comfort zones and to open your heart to difference, to unfamiliarity, to people, situations, to feelings you haven't had before, to challenge your values, to challenge your assumptions, challenge what you take for granted. Because as we lawyers like to say, I'm exhibit A. <laughs> it can change your life. It can change who you are, but not only you, it can also, one person at a time, change our community and our world for the better. Thank you. Be seeing you.